baby. Come on up. Everybody, little baby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Miss Elsie in our own church made this, handmade this. So we want to thank her, Miss Olive. And this is just a, a beautiful, beautiful dress and a beautiful necklace we gave to her yesterday by me and Poppy. And we're so excited to do this. We believe that it's not just dedicated to the child, but it's also dedicated to the parents. We don't do it necessarily infant baptism. We, like in the Old Testament days, we came before the Lord and even into the New Testament and dedicate our children. But we are saying we are also dedicating our lives and pledging to you several things. Among them, we pledge as Christian parents that we will bring up our daughter in a Christian household. We pledge that to you. We want her to look to God for wisdom, for strength, for honor, and we want her to see that in our lives. So we pledge that to you. We promise to give her every possible benefit of home, of schooling, and of church. And I think she's got the most awesome church in the world to be able to grow up in as she becomes an official church kid. And we promise to pray with her, and we promise to pray for her, asking God to reveal his plan in her life, that his hand would be heavy on her, knowing that that is when she is truly blessed, when she is fulfilling the purpose that God has given her. And lastly, we pledge to you to ask God's blessings upon the life of Mercy Hope, to guide her, to guard her, to direct her through all the years, looking forward with great anticipation what he will do through this little one right here, okay? Now, church, you also have a responsibility and the honor to play a key part in the life of Mercy Hope, all right? So I'm going to ask you a question, and at the end of it, if you likewise agree, you would just say, we do. Do you, church, likewise recognize that children are a gift from God? Do you pledge to demonstrate love to her, to pray for her, to pray with her, to be a great example through the years, as long as she can focus on you and all the children, if you would pray for them and pray for her parents, please pray for her parents. Please, please pray for her parents, because when Mercy Hope is in college, this parent will be 94 years old. You see what I'm saying? So you... Pray for her, pray for us, if you promise to be the best example you can and to love her and shelter her, would you say, we do? We do. Amen. All right. Mercy Hope, I have your very first Bible. And as Pastor Steve would say, you need to read this on your way home. Make sure you have it memorized. And I also have a certificate with calligraphy on it that Eric Barton did, very, very fancy. And I've written a letter, and this is something we do for everyone who is dedicated. And I wrote her a letter, not from Daddy but from pastor. And this is for every child who's dedicated Potter's hand. And it's dated today, and it says, Dear Mercy Hope, on this date, your parents came before the Lord and your church family here at the Potter's hand to dedicate themselves and you to the Lord whom they worship and they serve. They recognize that you are a gift from God, and they give thanks to him for bringing you into their lives. They promised on this day to train you in the things of God, looking to him for divine guidance, wisdom, and strength. And they ask God to also bless your life, to make you a blessing to others as you allow the Holy Spirit to fill you with his power. Your church family has promised to encourage your parents as they grow in the faith to always be there for you when you need help living the Christian life that God has planned for you. And Mercy Hope, even though you probably won't remember this day, <laughs> I pray that we will. And we will especially remember the vows we have made to God today on your behalf. May you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus. May you grow up to live a life at the end of it all that is pleasing to him. With my deepest love, Pastor, a.k.a. Daddy. <laughs> May I present to you, church, Mercy Hope Mitchell. <laughs> yes. Does that feel like a Lion King moment to anyone else? Hey, <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's so beautiful. Would you pray with me? Let's pray for little Mercy Hope together, okay? Let's pray, baby. God, we thank you for this gift of life. You are so good to us. We recognize that all life is a gift from you, and we are truly grateful. God, we pray that you would bless her, that you would grow her up, and allow her to serve you in a powerful way. We commit her to you. We commit ourselves to you. We ask for your protection every day of our lives. In Jesus' name, we give her to you. Amen and amen. There you go. You can take her back. Thank you, baby. Awesome. As we continue to worship, we move into our first song. If you're a guest, it is so good to have you here. Please stop by the Welcome Center on your way out. Miss Shannon has a gift for you and a welcome bag. Otherwise, let's stand. If you have an offering or a gift for the Lord, you come bring it to the treasure chest during this first song. Let's worship. Morning, church. Morning, morning, morning. 
There we were, looking at three sons, three boys, three brothers. Let's just hypothetically call them Jeff, Tim, and Matt, okay? Three, in fact, while we're talking hypothetically, let's just put up just a random picture of three, just picking, you know, three guys. We'll call the oldest one Jeff, we'll call the middle one Tim. What shall we call this handsome young lad right here? How about Matt? We'll call him Matt, okay? Now, pay no attention to Grandpa or this fisherman over here, and certainly pay no attention to the socks that I know you are envying right now. This is purely a hypothetical situation. It really is, but I wanted to give you a visual. These three sons grew up. They all got married. They all went their own way, and they were very successful. They had everything the world could offer. They did well. They prospered, and years and years and years went by, and they decided they would get back together, and they would do something special for their elderly mother. They decided they wanted to do something above and beyond to show love for their mom. So they got together, and the first one, the oldest one, we'll just call him Jeff, said, guys, you don't even need to worry about it. I've got it covered. Because unbeknownst to you, over the last year, I have commissioned a house to be built, a mansion. And I've paid for it, and the deed, the title, it is hers, free and clear. She's already getting ready to move in. So don't even bother doing anything. Well, the second son, not to be outdone by the first, says, Jeff, that's good, but you don't need to worry about it because I've already done something. I went out and I found out what mom's favorite car was, and I got it in her favorite color. And I got her this incredible, pristine, brand new Mercedes, and it is so, but that's not it. I went and got a chauffeur, a driver who is at her beck and call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In fact, I have paid his salary for 10 years. All she has to do is pick up that phone, snap her fingers, and he is there. Well, the third son, the humble and respected (laughs) God, why are you laughing? Said, guys, that's great, and I appreciate that, and I know mom's really interested in all that, but do you remember how much mom enjoyed reading her Bible? And the brothers rolled their eyes, because there he is getting spiritual again, he says, Mom just loved to spend time with the Lord and to have that time in his word and to linger in his presence and have that quiet time and just go on and on and pray. And Y'all remember that? Do you remember how sad she got when her eyesight began to go just a little bit more with each passing year and she struggled to read God's word? Remember how sad that brought her and, and, and she was just, just not quite who she used to be because she wanted to spend that time? Well, I went out and I found a doctorate seminary professor who had been secretly training a parrot to recite the entire Bible. True story. I went out and I saw this parrot and I heard about it and I went and I convinced him and I met with this guy and I said, guys, you you won't believe that this parrot, it took 12 years for this seminary professor to train. This bird, this parrot will recite God's word. All mom is going to have to do is be able to say, Genesis 1-1. And he was like, ah, in the beginning was the word. And he would say the whole thing. Or Quote me the book of Ezekiel, and the entire book of Ezekiel would be quoted by this parrot. This parrot is unlike anything else and will bring mom so much joy. Let's see what she likes best. So a few months pass, and a thank you letter arrives in the mail on the same day with all three brothers. The first one says, Dear Jeff, the oldest, the house you built is amazing. Thank you so much for it. But it is so huge. And really, I live only in one tiny room on the first floor. I don't get around in it much. But now I still have to dust it and clean it, and it's just not that good for me. To the second one, dearest Tim, she wrote, the middle child, I appreciate the Mercedes. It is nice, but I am just getting too old to travel. I can't get around, and I stay most of the time in the home. And quite honestly, I don't use a Mercedes because I'm lost wandering the halls in this home. And that driver you gave me is the rudest man ever. Please take him back. (laughs) Ah, but dearest Matthew... Dear, dear sweet youngest son, she wrote to her third and probably favorite son, (laughs) you've always had good godly wisdom, and you had the great sense to know what I really wanted, to know what your mom likes, and I want to tell you that strange-looking chicken you sent me was absolutely delicious. (laughs) I can't wait to eat. That is not real love. That is not a true story, by the way, for those who say that, okay? (laughs) Mom's not eating 12-year-old parrots or whatever. These guys in this story meant to love well, but they didn't love like Jesus. 
What we're going to discuss today is something that is so radical, y'all, something that this world needs to hear more of. How do we go that extra mile and actually love like Jesus? Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 9, or pull up your favorite Bible app. While you do that, let me welcome those who are streaming with us, those who are joining us online. It is great to have you with us. Our online campus seems to be growing every week as well, and we are thrilled to have you. Mark chapter 9, verse 35, but hold your place there. Don't read it quite yet. I want to set the stage for you and give you the proper context, because context is everything when you look at Scripture. Jesus is walking along some dirty, dusty roads with his disciples, and when he gets to the city, he stops, and he turns to them, and he asks them a very bizarre question, because it's a question he already knows the answer to. He turns to them, and he walks, and he goes, guys, guys, let me ask you something. We're here now. What was it you guys were arguing about back on the road? What was that dispute about? And guess what their answer was? Nothing. Silence. Crickets. You know why they were silent? Because if you read the pretext of what we're about to study, they were embarrassed. They were ashamed because it says here they were arguing about who would be the greatest in the kingdom to come. Busted. Jesus knew it. He, heard, he already knew what was in their hearts. But he asked the question. I love what Jesus does. He holds up a mirror. He didn't rebuke him. He just, he just like, hey, what was that you're arguing about? Have a look at yourself. <laughs> right? And we see, oh, man, can you imagine their shame and their shock? Like, uh, nothing. We, we weren't talking about nothing. I was talking about chicken. I wanted to get something to eat. You know, what, what were they saying? They had crickets to say. So Jesus, I love what he does. He calls them together. and says, guys, come here. And he has one of his famous holy huddles. And he brings them in. And he says this to him. He says in verse 35, guys, if you really want to be first, you must be last. You want to be great, you need to be the servant of all. You want to be great? I get that. The way to greatness is to make yourself lower. <laughs> the disciples are like, what is this? This, this Messiah we trust in and we believe in, we, why is he He's so radical? I, Everything he teaches is so, we're ready for him to take on Rome and get out the sword. And he's supposed to be the Messiah. Let's take it, get these oppressors out of here. And Jesus is like, love people. <laughs> and the disciples didn't quite get him. They didn't quite get it. It would be like running a race, coming in dead last, and yet getting the biggest trophy. That's how strange this sounded to them. For the first time, they've ever heard these kind of radical thoughts. I heard a pastor who was teaching a Bible conference for children. And he met all week long, and he said, if you guys study this service thing, this love thing, and you get it, by the end of the week, I will throw a huge party, and we will do banana splits and Sundays and everything, everything you love, but you got to show me you get my message of this week. So the week went, and they were doing great, and then he said, all right, that's it, line up. Everybody line up all the way up here to my giant ice cream sundae cart. And they jostled, and they elbowed for their place in line, and when it all shook out, and they had fought for their spot, he looked at them, and he says... You don't get it. Everybody turn 180 degrees and face that way. And he took his cart and he went down to the other end. And now the one who was last was first. Think they remembered that lesson after that? Absolutely. The first was last. He said, you didn't get it. This is what the disciples were struggling with here. Jesus shows up and he says, if you want to be great, you actually need to be a servant. What? This was so strange. So he calls his disciples again. He can look in their eyes. They're not getting it. And he has another holy huddle, okay? Get ready. Buckle up. I'm giving you your warning. Get your steel-toed boots on. Here it comes. He calls them together, and he says, guys, here's what we're going to do. I want you to go on ahead. I want you to get an upper room, and I want you to prepare it for our Passover. We would soon call it the Last Supper because we know now this was his Last Supper. And he says, I want you to go get together. Now, let me set the scene and the context here. This is the last hours of Jesus' life. Within 24 hours, he will have been arrested and crucified. And he is keenly aware of this. He knows what's coming. The gravity of the moment is not lost on Jesus. He sees this, and he looks at his disciples, and he's like, y'all still don't get it. You're arguing over who would be the greatest? He hears that lingering in the air, and he knows he's facing death. Add to that the fact that in a minute, he's going to go pray in the garden and say, can you pray with me just one hour? Could you just stay awake one hour? And he comes back, and they've all fallen asleep. Then, add to that, when the soldiers come to arrest him, they scatter. The ones who just said, even if I have to die for you, I will be, they gone. All of them, they scattered. 
and you're arguing about who's going to be the greatest? Are you serious? Greatness for these guys was still a long, long way off. But yet Jesus doesn't give up on them. Man, I would have. Let me put this in a better illustration. As they walk to the place where they would have their last supper, they come in. Jesus is thinking, man, I'm nervous about these guys. I know I would be. This is that group of people that I have poured my life into for three and a half years. Y'all know when I pull out the car, it's going to be something good in here, right? Like some M&Ms or a dog collar or something. So Jesus walks into the upper room, and every single one of them walks into the room ahead of him and walks right by the basin, the towel, and the pitcher. Now, you need to know something about this upper room. He's looking at them thinking, guys, you want to be great? You be a servant. You want to be thought of as much? You make less of yourself. And every single one of them marched right by the basin and the bowl and the pitcher and the towel. And he looks at them, and he knows he has a chance to teach one last lesson. So what he does is he says, I'm going to show you something. Now, let's talk about their shoes. Why was it important to wash someone's feet back then? Because, y'all, the roads were nasty. The feet were stinky. They were muddy, and when it rained, it got even worse, and they had ruts in them and rocks, and the carts were pulled by animals, and animals always leave presents in the road, and they find them. And they didn't have shoes like we had. They didn't have these big boots and work boots. They could take them off, and their feet are all clean. You know what they had? They had the equivalent of these. <laughs> what are these? Crocs. Raise your hand if you have a pair. Oh, you're going to hate this. You know, you're going to hate Crocs, you know what these mean? Take a look at this right here. Crocs are basically the sign that you have completely given up on looking normal. <laughs> That's what these are. It's, do you see the holes? Do you see the holes in these shoes? You know what this is? This is where your dignity has leaked out. This is... <laughs> This is where your self-respect has gone bye-bye, right? Even your pets know you should not wear these. Even the cat knows you shouldn't be seen in public wearing them. Or this one right here. He's doing you a favor, y'all. Just let him eat it. And do- we won't tell anybody that you once had Crocs. It'll be our secret. You think you look good wearing these? The truth of it is this. Here, I'll put them on for you. I will show you what you look like. This is kind of what they had. They had sandals. And they leaked. And they had, in fact, Christopher went out and found an actual photo of the sandals that St. Peter wore in game seven against the Romans. Here it is right here. You can see it. This is it. This is when he signed his Nike contract. Look at how much they leak. The roads were filthy. And having your feet washed was not a luxury like it is for us, it was a necessity. And yet every single one of the disciples walked right by this bin. So Jesus does something that absolutely blows them away. He goes up and he takes the towel, the servant's towel, and he does something they were not expecting. He takes his own outer robe off and he takes the servant's towel and he wraps it around himself. The Messiah, the Savior, puts on a towel showing he is the least in the room. You know why? Think about this. You may not know. That upper room was a rented room. It was a borrowed room. That wasn't their home, which means there was no servant included, which meant that whoever stopped and picked up this towel would be saying, they're not the greatest. They're the least. And not one of the disciples did that. They all walked right by. They, They know. They live there. They know how stinky their feet are. And yet every single one is like, oh, dude, nothing to see here. They just move along. Not doing. And they come in, and Jesus shocks the world. We're talking about it 2,000 years later and picks up the towel and says, I got this. I'm going to show you something. And what he does is so astounding. He takes the pitcher and he brings their feet over and he starts to pour the water in and wash each one of their feet. Now, let me ask you something. You think... They were a little embarrassed at that moment. I think maybe a little bit of color came to their cheeks. When the one that they look up to, the master, stops to do what they were too proud to do. I bet you could cut that awkward tension with a knife. You could probably hear a pin drop. And then Jesus says, guys, come close. 
do you see what I've done for you? Do you get this? That sets up this next scripture that we read together. John chapter 13. And he says, do you see what I have done for you? Verse 13, you call me teacher. You call me Lord. And you say, right, because I am. If I then, the Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, how much more should you wash one another's feet? For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. And look, look at verse 17. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Y'all remember what blessed means? We talked about this. Blessed means not just happy. It means, oh, how happy. It means exceedingly happy. It means joyful happy. Like, I am so content. I have purpose. I wake up in the morning, and I'm so excited. I'm fired up. I have God's peace. I have his favor. I'm not worried about a thing. I have eternal life coming, and I've got abundant life now. That's what blessed means. He says, if you really want to be great, my disciples, which is us now, the way to be great is by being a servant. I know you guys are excited about a title, Peter. James, I know you guys are saying, you know what? I'm not going to give you a title. I'm giving you a towel. <laughs> Truth grenade. I know you want a title, but you know what? You're not getting it. Not even he came for that. He offers us the servant's towel. Y'all, that is so huge. If we grasp this one point, if we look at Jesus' life and we think these, he never sat down and said, serve me. Not a single time do we find in Scripture. He was always busy serving others, loving people, healing people, giving of his time, his treasure, his talents, everything he had. He never left a town the same way as when he walked in. He looked for people to serve. In fact, I love how Dino Rizzo says it. He says this, he, he aggressively sought to serve humankind, even to the extent of dying on a cross. He looked for it. He searched for it, and he went and he served it. He wasn't passive. He wasn't like, I'll serve, I'll love if it's convenient, if it doesn't cost too, if the cost isn't too high, I've, you know, I, I got some stuff I really want to do on, on that day. Pastor, I, I'm kind of busy. Jesus was aggressive. He looked for it. He was aggressive with his love. He wasn't accidental. He was so intentional with it. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave you with three key ways that you can do today of how to love like Jesus did. When you look at him and I see these things, these things, think about it. If you want a more significant life, if you want to feel more purpose and passion, emulate the master. He had everything we've looked for. Peace, you want it? He had it. Love for others? He had it. Strength, grace, stamina, you name it. Everything is embodied in him. Joy, passion. So how did he do it? The first thing I noticed right away when I look at him, and this is step one for all of us, write this down. He esteemed others higher than himself. Who does this? The God man? Are you kidding? Jesus, he esteemed others higher than himself. Now hear me. I am not saying think less of yourself. All right? Time out. I am not saying think of yourself. I'm a loser. I'm so low. I slither on the ground in the dirt. I eat worms. Nobody loves me. That is not what Jesus is saying. You know what? C.S. Lewis, the great writer, he said it perfectly. He said... It is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Wow. We'll talk about a beautiful encapsulation of this whole scripture. This first step alone, church, if we just get this, this changes everything because it changes how you view the person sitting next to you. When we esteem others higher than ourselves, when we say, how can I serve you? How can I meet your needs? It puts our proper perspective on and it emulates the master. Look at what Matthew chapter 20 says. I'll put the verse up. It says, even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. What? To give his life as a ransom for many. This, there it is. If you need it in one word, there it is. It's summed up in the word serve. This is incredible, all right? I'm going to put this in modern day terms that we can all appreciate. If you want to be a Christian, you will serve and you will love and you will do it like Jesus. Being a Christian who doesn't serve is like going to Krispy Kreme on a diet. Let that sink in. Being a Christian who doesn't serve is so weird to the Bible, so foreign. It would be like us going to Krispy... Oh, look at these donuts. Just give me a minute. Oh, I love you, donuts. You're the only one who understands me. 
Oh, Krispy Kreme. I love it. You know what? I'm going to gather up the kids and the wife, and we're going to go downtown, and we're going to see that conveyor belt that goes. You know you've seen it. Don't act like you have it. And it's dripping this great heavenly glaze, and it's so awesome. And the kids are drooling. They're like, Dad, that's awesome. Can we have some? I'm like, no. You see how goofy that would be? That is what being a Christian who doesn't serve, it's, it's foreign to the Bible. You're not saved to sit. We're saved to serve to be his hands and feet, to be the great example, to be the church that people look up to and go, wow, I don't know what they believe, but I know they love people. I know that slogan that's on our wall that says, love God, love people is more than just words to them because they put it in action. And anytime you look at Krispy Kreme, I want you to remember that. And if you have problem with gluttony, I understand, take a number. Here's what we do. We always remind ourselves, my favorite next picture, they are wholesome goodness for your whole family, okay? So don't feel bad. Krispy Kreme is now healthy. You can enjoy it, and if you have any problems with this, just notice how creepy her stare is at these donuts. And if that doesn't do it for you, then look at the alien hand with two thumbs. Just saying, right? I don't know why that's there. Has nothing to do with the sermon, just thought it was cool. As you look at what God says, we are to esteem others higher than ourselves. This is his whole point. He never left a city the same as he found it. Even if he could sneak into a village unannounced, soon he began loving people and healing people. And then the crowds came and a fire was lit and you couldn't get the crowds away because love attracts people. Serving people, heartfelt acts of generous service has always fed the hungry crowds. It has always drawn a crowd. It did then, it does today. Love that is pure and authentic will draw people, period. And if you have a problem, Overcoming the sinful flesh, overcoming those selfish desires to always put our needs first. And I get it. We will wrestle with that until the Lord takes us. Remember this simple three-letter word. We've talked about it. Joy. Put Jesus first, others next, and yourself last. If you can remember that simple acrostic, you right there have taken a huge step to emulating the Savior. How awesome is that? To live like he lived, which brings you to step two, to loving like Jesus. Give with no strings attached. Mm -mm -mm. Here we go. You ever gotten a gift that kind of wasn't really a good gift? It had strings attached, told you when you could use it, where you could use it, how you could use it? That gift stinks. That's not a gift. That's like getting those great things. I don't know about you, but I got an email that said, there is a Nigerian prince that wants to, did you get it too? He wants to give us $6 million if we would just put it in our bank account. On the same day, I get an email that says, you have won an all-expense-paid trip to Fiji. I was so excited. I get on the phone. I call Amy. I say, Amy, pack up the kids. Not only do we have $6 million coming from this Nigerian prince, and I know it's legit, we just won a trip to Fiji. And I'm reading it to it. I'm so excited. I say, this is, oh, wait a minute. Hang on, baby. All right, I'm reading the fine print. It says, sorry, this trip is for one person only. Must be between the ages of eight and nine. No family allowed. Must be used on the third Tuesday of a winter month when the moon is full and the wind is blowing from the southeast. That's not a gift. That's lame. That is such a gift with strings attached. I don't even want it. Not long ago, I got a mailer. Came in the, car, in the mail with scratch-offs to a car dealership. Oh, these are so good. You know about scratch-offs, don't you? Yeah, I've been meaning to talk to you about your lottery addiction. As we, uh, as, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But seriously, if you win, make sure you tithe. As we, uh, <laughs> what, what, did I say that out loud? Sorry. As you scratch it off, it says you must bring this card to the dealership. And scratch, you have already won. You have won at least one of these three things. You have already won it. Write it down, okay? And I was like, oh, Amy, come on, load up the kids again. We're going. So we go down, and we're scratching off, scratching off A. And A is a brand new Cadillac. And I'm like, this, 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 this is sorry, you didn't win. I'm like, that's okay. And the guy's like, relax. You've won at least B or C. All you got to do is scratch. You will win one of these. I'm like, this is the best day ever. It's a win-win. These people love us. They don't, they're not trying to sell us anything. They just want to bless us. So I'm scratching off B, and man, my heart's picking up. I'm so excited because these people are so, so nice to us. And I'm scratching off B. B is a trip to Paris, by the way. Oh, and it says, you did not win the trip to Paris. That's okay, guys, because we're going to win C. Guess what C is? 
I'm scratching it off. Man, we're leaning in. People are gathering around. This is it. I'm going to win the Camaro. I know it. And I scratch off and says, you have one. An all-expense-paid overnight trip to Siler City. <laughs> that gift stinks. <laughs> that is so not... W- if I have to do something, and i got to buy a car too, by the way. If we have ever done something for someone and we have left them with the impression that they owe us anything, we've not done it right. Jesus never did that. If we do something good and we are trying to be like Jesus and we expect something bad, if they ever feel that they're indebted to us for anything, we have not loved like Jesus. You're doing it wrong. I've told you guys this. The best way to give, if you can give anonymously, do it. There's nothing cooler than sitting at that restaurant watching that server that you pulled aside earlier and says, I want to pay for that family's meal. And you watch the joy come up. What do you mean I can't pay? And you're sitting there, and they're looking. You look down. I didn't see that. And you're giggling. You love it. And you see. You gave, and you expected nothing in return. And it is awesome because that's loving like Jesus did. Going the extra mile. When someone asks you to go one, you go two with no strings attached, which lastly brings you to point three. When you serve, when you give, be ridiculously generous. Love people lavishly. Why? Because Jesus did. Why? Look at the, this is exactly what we receive from God. Think about the exchange God made with us. You ready for this? We get Christ, his love, his forgiveness, the slate wiped clean, that alone is it enough for, for us. Then we get an abundant life now with peace, with passion, with joy, with stamina for the day and a reason to get out of bed in the morning. We get all this, plus we get heaven, eternal life, streets of gold, all the tears wiped away, reunited with family members who know the Lord. I mean, it is incredible. All that, and in return, he gets us. What a deal for us, right? Think about that. What an exchange. This is, this is God showing amazing, lavish, generous love. It's going so beyond what's expected. It is not being average. I want to be the church that when we ever move or we have to close our doors, the lost world is sad. They're bummed because they say, I don't know that they believe, and I don't know if I get the Jesus stuff, but I can tell you this. They loved people. I hate to see them move. I hate to see them go because we were authentic with our love. That little nice slogan on the walls right there, that must have meant something more than words to that church because that's how Jesus loved. He never expected in return, and he went above and beyond. I know I go over this a lot because I want this to be part of our DNA. When you give lavishly and generously with your time and your love, it is the most contagious thing that can run through a church. There are people who don't want to leave this church when it's over. You know that? I have seen people come I'll go after church, I'll put my Bible away, put my notes away, maybe take a shower and come back and I will, there's still 100, 150 people here for like an hour or two. Go home, people. (laughs) Some of us got to eat. No, no, it's awesome. You know why? Because there's that koinonia fellowship and it's attractive and people want that. There's a refit class that happened on Saturday. We talked to these instructors, there was like 70 people here. They didn't want to leave. You know what they said? They said, your people are so friendly. There is something going on. We don't want to go. And I was like, "Ah, thank you, Lord. People are seeing it and they're getting it because genuine love attracts people. People are hungry for that. And you are doing it. Let me share with you something that just happened this week that no one knows. Get ready. I get a phone call. My wife says, there's a lady coming. She wants to see you. I knew who she was, but she doesn't go to this church. Hadn't seen her in a long time. She comes up, she knocks on that door in that lobby, which is the wrong door because no one will hear it on a Monday, but I I did find her, and she comes and she goes, hi, Pastor Matt, and she hands me this card in an envelope, and she says, I just wanted to, I won't take much of your time, I didn't want to tell you over the phone, but I want to give you this, and then I want to pray for you. I said, okay. She hands me this card, and she says, "I, I just want to do something for you and for your church because of the beautiful ordained ministry that is going on at the potter's hand. She said she was in her prayer time, reading God's word, studying. And she felt God tell her to get up and go into her bedroom and go to her, what was it, armoire, jewelry thing? Open it up. And she said, pray about this. And she felt God telling her, go through this. You can't wear 
half of this if you had a thousand lifetimes. She said, all these things you've accumulated over the years. She said God was showing her stuff, stuff that was buried, stuff she hadn't worn. There was jewels and pearls and gold necklaces she had forgotten about, stuff that if she wore a different outfit every three hours, every day, she couldn't even get to the stuff she collected. And most of it she would never wear again, totally forgot about. She said she felt led to take this and sell it, and she wrote a check to the potter's hand. She handed me a check, and then she said, and I want to do this. I don't want you to ever say my name. But I don't mind you telling, I am doing this in honor of my prayer partner, Pat Lancaster. That's awesome. She handed us a check. Y'all, I mean, it was the third largest check I've ever seen for this church. She handed that to her. She doesn't even go here. She lives in the neighboring city. Y'all, that is ridiculous generosity. She was obedient. Let me ask you this. Do you think God was pleased with that? Oh, buddy, you know why? Here it is. Here is your truth grenade. We are never more like Christ than when we are loving or serving. Church, you want to be like Jesus? We are never more like his son. We are never more like the son of God when we are serving people and loving people. And we do it with no strings attached. And we do it ridiculously, lavishly. We love people and we say, I don't want anything back. And we esteem others higher than ourselves. Y'all, that is, that is so powerful. That is what God is leading us to do. When we truly look at Jesus' example, the one who sat on the throne, the one who left it all, the one who had it all, and wrote himself into the story to save us from ourselves, who left angels worshiping him, 500 billion or more that could have done his bidding at a moment's notice, came down here, was mocked, beaten, abused for us, left it all, maybe it's not so difficult for us to stop and pick up the towel, right? You want your challenge? Your challenge is this. This week, look for a chance to love like Jesus and then do it. Don't complicate this. Look for that chance. God will have it for you. If you are open and you are obedient, say, God, help me love like you this week. It could be something small. It could be something anonymous. Whatever it is, look for that chance to pick up the servant's towel and then do it. Love like Jesus. Challenge has been issued. Challenge accepted. Ah, It's up to you. Let me pray for you about it. Bow with me. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the power in it and that it never comes back void, that it always has new, fresh depth to teach us. Lord, I pray we would love like you, that you would be pleased with the attitudes and the actions we do every day. Forgive us for the times we blow it. Forgive us for the times that we put cost and convenience ahead of serving others and help us to be about your business. God, help us to be authentic, to love people with no strings attached to not expect things in return or to manipulate people or to love for any kind of accolade or award other than you saying, well done, good and faithful servant. I accept your worship. God, that's what we are all about. Adjust our focus, Lord. Help us to love you, to love others, to serve you and to serve others. That is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.